Well, the silly point's gone in for the right-hander, Amos. Carrick six overs now for 29. Bowled uh, quite tidily. One thirty-nine for two. And that's taken 35 overs. 20 overs left. And uh, possibly one more over before lunch. Steve Oldham to bowl it. Kelly around to face. <laughs> another extremely good stop uh, by David Burster. A lot of ground then. Yeah, good stop this. They made a lot of ground there, did David Bairstow. They well stopped a certain two runs. Scorching cover drive from the bat of the little left-hander. So just uh, two balls left in uh, Steve Oldham's over. That's a bit unlucky. Outside edge streaks away for uh, four runs off the last ball here before lunch. No slip in there. Doubt in fact whether it would have carried to slip. That uh, might just a bit short to slip. So 146 for two, and uh, I think Warwick should be highly pleased with their performance here this morning. They've got the sort of base they want. They've got Kelly Turan not out at lunch with 63. Amos is partner with 10. Smith going when the score was 11, and Dyer when the score was at 124. Wicket takers this morning, side bottom one for 16 and Oldham uh, one for 34 on a very good pitch and an exceedingly fast outfield. Well, at uh, four and over, that's a very good base, as Jim Laker remarked, something for Warwickshire to exploit with eight wickets in hand this afternoon. I must say, I don't think things quite went Yorkshire's way this morning, did they? No, they've had an edge or two, and they've had one or two near LBW shouts and an odd player miss, and uh, 
Well, there'd been a lot they could have had another wicket or two, and I think they were disappointed in that last ball then because I imagine they've been discussing having a slip on just before lunch for Dennis Amos. Yes, Bairnstow looked a bit frustrated. Yeah, there. well, they probably discussed it. One right. said yes, one said no. <laughs> there, was, there was some good uh, opening bowling by Sidebottom and Fletcher. We'll have a look at the first wicket. It was uh, Sidebottom bowling to David Smith. And he, he reached for there, didn't he? Yes, yeah, so it was a little bit wide. It wasn't a bad delivery, <laughs> um, but just that little bit wide. And Keith Smith, he wouldn't have been really pleased with himself at playing that delivery, I wouldn't think. 11 for one in the uh, fifth over, and he was out for seven. Kalicharan, obviously a very dangerous man from Yorkshire's point of view. He's been in prime form this summer. Yes, I think he's a world-class player, and obviously Yorkshire wanted him in early and out early. Mm. They got him in early, but they didn't get him out early, but he's a very fine player. Mm. Robin Dyer, he did a tremendous straight, job, yeah. forward, forward player, isn't he? Yes, he did a good job. He, he scored his, his 1,500 balls, which is decent for an opener, and he got them a base now from to the wish they can attack. It's interesting how Warwickshire were able to increase the tempo. It was early on about 3-0, and, oh, and they moved it up to 4. It is a good base, isn't it? Anyway, let's uh, discuss that in a moment. Dyer uh, facing Oldham, and uh, this dismissal. Oh, well, that never recovered. Yes, he was trying to play it a little bit on the onside, and uh, he got just a little bit across it, and it got slightly outside edge as he went through it. You can see he was going to play it on the onside, then tried to stop, and a very good catch, in fact, by Steve Oldham falling through in his wrong hand, which is a good catch there. So it was 124 for two at that point after 31 and a bit overs, and still Humpage to come in to give it a, a bit of a whack. So uh, Warwickshire must be uh, feeling this is a promising position. Yes, they're, they're in a good position. New Yorkshire will want them to get above between, say, five and six and over, because anything above that makes it a very big score indeed to start chasing. But having said that, it's a very good wicket, a very fast outfield. What Yorkshire don't want now is the clouds to descend, it become heavy. And, and on this uh, loop ground, because the Yorkshire boys are well, pretty well. They've kept a good, accurate, consistent attack. And uh, all the conditions are favouring the batsmen here. These North Ants boys have been made to fight for the runs. This is Steve Olden bowling now to uh, Richard Williams, who's come in and just played one or two quite delightful shots in the last over or two. So the formidable opening partnership uh, of Larkins and Cook here was broken when Larkins was uh, very well caught, in fact, by Moxon. At a short cover off Stevenson. Good catch that. Bairstow's picked up a couple of stumpings off the bowling of Carrick, and uh, Jeff Cook is top scorer to date with 64. And that stroked away quite nice by uh, Robert Bailey there for a single. One of the men I'm quite sure that uh, even the selectors might keep an eye on. Uh, Robin Bailey is the non striker at the moment. Big uh, tall boy who's re already created a very good impression in uh, really his limited amount of cricket he's, he's played this season. But, uh, Williams now knowing that there's some urgency required because Northants have been used to building some pretty big scores on this ground. Wayne Larkin's making a magnificent 170 here last year. And Yorkshire have got uh, quite a formidable lineup to come. So it, it's nicely poised, but uh, North Ants will be looking to, for a 2.20, 2.30 total, or their 40 overs are up. Williams trying his best there. Big shout for LBW, but rather think it was going to miss leg stump. One, 61 for three now. Get, uh, another look at Robert Bailey, very tall. And he's gone, little outside edge there. Bairstow's having a good afternoon. Two stumpings and a catch. And uh, he probably talked Bailey out there by saying that uh, he was a batsman with a lot of promise. But, uh, useful delivery there from uh, Steve Oldham. Might just have moved a little bit off the pitch. But uh, there's that last delivery again. Coming back to Duncan Wilde. And it was a very good delivery, as you could see on the replay there. It straightened up very nicely, moved away from the right hander, and just a little delicate outside edge through to uh, Bairstow. The 
first wicket of the day to go down here was uh, Wayne Larkins. So a particularly good catch here. It was uh, fairly hammered with a cross bat. Moxon's the man in shot there at uh, short cover. That was going about throat height, and he took it exceedingly well. So Larkins went for uh, 43. The new batsman is wild. First victim then for Steve Oldham. In uh, the veteran class, of course, Steve now. Gave great service for Yorkshire. Went down to Derby and has come back, done a great job for him, particularly in one day cricket this year. Very seldom goes through a, one of these games without picking up a wicket here and there. Well, he's got one this time, one for 29 in his eight overs. So uh, that's good, accurate bowling on this pitch. Very uh, heavy scoring Holden ground, all bit to uh, Luton. Taken at one for 29. <coughs> one uh, 61 for four now. The uh, top scorer of the afternoon today was uh, Jeff Cook. See him here dancing down the wicket to Carrick. The ball just spinning a little bit and presenting a very comfortable stumping chance there for David Bairstow. So Cook went stump Bairstow, bolt Carrick for 64. Uh, we're through uh, 34 overs here. Six to go, 161 for four. Holding once WPC Fletcher had been shot. To that, the answer was less clear. It depended on whether the violence was continuing, said Sir John. It was clear the government wanted a diplomatic settlement. That apart, it's the fact that Britain could have searched Libyan bags that's likely to heighten public anxiety about the kind of offences covered by diplomatic immunity. A car bomb has gone off outside the Turkish embassy in Vienna, killing a man believed to be an embassy official. Three others were injured, including an Austrian policeman. No one has claimed responsibility, but the possibility that it was an attack by Armenian terrorists hasn't been ruled out. From Vienna, David Hermges reports. The explosion happened alongside the Turkish embassy, and it was seen by an amateur cameraman. Beside the person killed, three people have been injured seriously, including the policeman on guard duty, who is critically ill. Austrian police are certain that the bomb was set off by a radio device. They know that the car belonged to a Turkish diplomat, but have been unable to establish whether the badly mutilated body in the car was his. Just as in an incident in the same building nine years ago, when the then Turkish ambassador to Austria was killed by terrorists, the police are investigating the possibility that the Armenian Liberation Organization was behind this latest attack. Here at home, railwaymen have begun their ban on delivering coal and coke to steelworks. Trains due to take supplies to Llanwern in South Wales and Ravenscraig in Scotland have been cancelled or are delivering only iron ore. British Steel say they'll now start road convoys to Ravenscraig. The train driver's leader, Ray Buckton, has been speaking about the miners' strike this morning to steel workers at their union conference in Scarborough. And he said it wasn't the British way of life to be battling it out in our villages. And he appealed to the government to intervene and not stand idly by. John Fryer reports. The train driver's leader, Ray Buckton, was here as chairman of the TUC. He said he understands the steel men's worries about helping the miners, but it's essential they do. I ask, for the sake of everybody, if you can, I ask you to reach some understanding with the National Union of Mine Workers to allow something positive to happen to help both you and them or be your steelworks. The steel men fear blast furnaces may be damaged if they're allowed to cool. One at Scunthorpe burst its sides last night and the local ISTC leader blames the miners' strike. Well, I think what is clear is that Scunthorpe is the one plant that's been hit the worst of all the five major plants. And this illustrates the danger we have with blast furnaces when we are in, in, in precarious states that we are now with fuel supplies. Mr Buckton called today for unity, but unity is plainly lacking. 
Mr Buckton's train drivers are already blacking coal trains, though the steel men have still to decide whether they'll be supporting the miners. Tomorrow, NUM leaders will be meeting transport union leaders in London to review the strike. Mr Buckton called today for sacrifices, and the union movement is putting more and more pressure on the steel men. Miners occupying the Betzhanger Colliery in Kent have called off their sit-in without yesterday's High Court order having to be served. Peter Gould saw them leave. A small crowd of Kent miners and their wives were gathered at the pit head, half expecting the police or bailiffs to arrive. Then came news of the agreement with the coal board, and the men inside began packing up their belongings. 2,000 feet below, it was also the end of the sit-in by eight striking miners who'd been underground for 60 hours. They had plenty of food and had been prepared to carry on with their protest. When they emerged into the sunlight, there were emotional scenes as they were greeted by their wives. Then there was a hero's reception from fellow miners and their families. They were in no doubt that they'd won a double victory. The two strike breakers had agreed to stay away from the colliery and the coal board had agreed that the pit was not in structural danger due to neglect. Even though the three-day occupation had passed off peacefully, most of these miners had been expecting some sort of confrontation with the police. And their union leader said that the decision of the two men not to continue breaking the strike had certainly prevented violence. Miners were out in strength to try to stop construction workers going into the Whitemore Colliery, one of the pits being modernised in the Selby coalfield. John Thorne was there. About 200 miners linked arms blocking the pit entrance as the police moved in. As the police tried to clear them, the scuffling began. It was more an oversized rugby scrum than a fight, but the construction workers had voted to go in and the police were there to help them. The strikers surged into the road as the van sped past. It's not the first time the new Selby coalfield has been a target, but this time there were pickets at every pit being modernized. Five arrests were made here and more at Rickall and Gascoigne Wood. But the confrontation was over in less than five minutes and the police were jeered as they marched away. A bricklayer was one of 17 workers who voted not to cross the picket line and his reward was the applause of the minor pickets. Britain's biggest teaching union, the NUT, has threatened to step up industrial action if talks on Friday don't end the teachers' pay dispute. The union says it'll call out 15,000 of its members on a three-day strike next week, almost double the number involved in the latest action, which ends tomorrow. The explosion at the Abbeystead water plant in Lancashire last month was caused by methane gas. It entered the tunnel from surrounding ground, possibly with ground water, according to an investigation by the Health and Safety Commission. It's not yet known definitely what caused the gas to ignite, killing 15 and injuring 28 others, but it's believed it could have been an electrical spark from a floodlight inside the underground chamber. The chairman of the commission, Dr John Cullen, gave a news conference this morning at Abbeystead and Martin Henfield was there. It was Dr Cullen's first visit to the underground chamber, which is still a tangle of twisted metal and shattered concrete. He was told how it's thought the methane accumulated in a tunnel leading to the chamber from the River Loon five miles away. When pumping began, water displaced the gas, forcing it along the tunnel and into the chamber. Investigators now believe a spark from an arc light in the corner of the chamber could have ignited the gas. In this case, we believe all the evidence points to it being an electrical spark, uh, by a floodlight over in the corner where people were standing. There's a theory that says this uh, underground valve house was basically designed wrongly and there should have been a vent for any gas build-up before it got into the chamber. Well, I think now looking back, yes, that, that is true. Of course, you have to recognise that nobody realised that an explosive mixture would develop. Nobody believed that methane existed in the, uh, in the design of this uh, installation. Every water authority in Britain is now being asked, could a similar type of explosion happen in your area? Officials are being asked to identify where a gas build-up might occur and what they're doing to prevent it. South Africa's longest-serving white anti-apartheid prisoner has arrived in Britain to an enthusiastic welcome from his family, friends and supporters. 
David Kitson, jailed in 1964 for crimes against the state, including sabotage, was released by the South African government last month, just before its Prime Minister was due in Britain. Clive Ferguson was among those who saw him arrive. The welcome at Heathrow was for a hero, for that's what David Kitson is in the eyes of his supporters and members of the African National Congress. Membership of the military wing of the ANC was one of the charges which led to Mr Kitson's jail sentence. Today, almost exactly 20 years since his arrest, he was pleased to be reunited with his family. Mr Kitson, how does it feel to be home again? Oh, I'm very pleased, but actually my home is South Africa. You know? But Mr Kitson was not convinced that his release could be regarded as marking a permanent change in South African government policy. Well, so now I think they're responding to pressure. As his daughter led the welcoming singing, Mr Kitson said he would be taking a few months off, then deciding on his future plans. Though it seems likely he'll retain his links with the anti-apartheid movement and the African National Congress. In Los Angeles, the man accused of plotting to murder his Harley Street colleague has been explaining in court why he paid an American two and a half thousand dollars. Dr. Brian Richards admitted yesterday that he told the American he wanted his colleague, Peter Stephan, killed, but he claimed it was a ruse to see whether the American, who had threatened Dr. Stephan's life, was serious about it. From Los Angeles, Rod Sharp. It was a day of explaining to the Californian court. Why did an American, Ronald Bennett, ask for and receive two and a half thousand dollars from Dr. Brian Richards, if not to murder Richards' partner, Peter Stephan? $2,500 was a figure to pull out of the air. Right, but the 25... You know, I have the foggiest idea how much it costs to have somebody killed. And why did Dr. Richards, appearing in his own defense, begin the negotiations that ended with the handing over of the money? I wanted to draw uh, Bennett out upon his intentions towards Peter, whether they were all entirely uh, decent and legal, as he had said inside, or whether there might be something more sinister. And you don't think there's a possibility of Dr. Bennett doing it? Certainly not. Back home, the first portrait of the Prime Minister to be hung in a national collection has been unveiled today at the National Portrait Gallery. Mrs Thatcher has apparently already expressed some reservations about the work and even insisted on the artist Rodrigo Moynihan making some alterations. We did have trouble, at least I had trouble with the eyes, and she was critical of them at various stages, and I did uh, alter them, you know, but uh, eyes are very... The slightest touch alters the direction, uh, the slightest touch alters the colour, and so they're very, it's a very kind of chancy, chancy business. Well, a time check now, it's 26 minutes to two. Time to go over to Michael Fish to consider the weather prospects. Good afternoon to you. Well, the headlines, as far as I'm concerned, are that there's much cooler weather on the way, but at the same time, a good deal of dry weather. If we look at the satellite picture, you can see that we have a change on the way because there's quite a lot of cloud to the northwest of the country. That, as a matter of fact, is a cold front that'll be bringing some outbreaks of rain. You'll notice over the central part of England, the clouds beginning to develop as it is over the north French coast, and that means some thundery showers later on in the day. So the detail now for Scotland and Northern Ireland, as you've just seen on that satellite picture, a good deal of cloud, a little rain around uh, just here and there at the moment, but there's a good deal of brightness as well, a little bit of sunshine. In fact, it will be bright and dry for a time in most places, but later on this afternoon that cloud will thicken up again and you'll have some further outbreaks of rain moving in from the west. Over England and Wales, there's a good deal of dry weather at the moment. In fact, many places having a hot, quite sunny afternoon, a very sticky one again too, 27 centigrade being 81 Fahrenheit. In northern parts of England, though, the cloud will thicken all the time, and later on in the day you'll get some outbreaks of rain, and perhaps that rain turning rather thundery too later on today. And in southern areas, there will be some thundery showers developing, possibly before the day is out. During the evening and night over Scotland and Northern Ireland, your rain will clear away, fresher, uh, uh, drier weather following along behind and over many northern and western parts of England and Wales the same is true you'll have your thundery rain around to begin with but before the night's over it will become dry and it'll become quite a bit cooler as well the rain though hanging on in that southeastern corner that's outbreaks of thundery rain right through to the morning and another quite warm night in that southeastern corner. Well now if we go to the Atlantic chart we can look at the reasons perhaps behind some of the weather we have at the moment and there straight away you see the cold front or cold fronts to the northwest of us they showed up very nicely just now on the satellite picture. Basically across the south of the country at the moment there's a ridge of high pressure so hence a good deal of dry weather today but that uh, ridge is pulling back and these fronts are going to be moving down from the northwest through all parts during the course of the next 20.